I thought I would go into January with not much to talk about, but I got footage for Quarantine Crab, I got another show about germs to talk about, and we have the biggest germ of all to talk about, the NFL wildcard game. Gross. Ironically enough, this is the only one of the three where I don't have to go sicko mode. <laughs> We finally got a sneak peek at Camp Coral and I have many thoughts, some good, some bad, and honestly just a lot more questions. Deadline writes, in a first look at the series premiere, The Jellyfish Kid, a young Spongebob is determined to catch his first jellyfish and his friends do whatever they can to help him. It sounds like a very natural premise that you can make a great episode with. You can go many routes with the idea. Having Spongebob build up this moment as a prestigious moment, maybe it separates the hierarchy of campers and by not being able to catch one you'll be seen as lesser. Maybe you can show the early forming of jellyfish fields and there's some lore there. This six minute clip, which is available on Twitter on Spongebob's Twitter that I'll link in the description and our pinned comment, doesn't show any of this. You see, I've always been a big proponent of wait until something is out before you cast judgment. I was one of the very few reviewers intentionally that didn't touch Cam Coral until I got material, under the chance that it would have been good and there was no reason for me to fear. Regardless of how big or small that chance was, I owe it to be fair and unbalanced. Given that all we have to go off of, based off of the internal opinion of Camp Coral, is a few social media posts from select staff. Given that the creator, bless his soul, has passed, we won't get a direct source of what the creator, the original creator of Spongebob, feels about the public showing of Camp Coral, this six minute clip that we have now. Not from the Spongebob movie, not a single frame, but an actual showing, regardless of if it's final or not. I'm going to assume that you watch this clip given that it's readily available for free for anyone to see. I'll link it below, so let me just go through just by section. The animation and art style for what seems to be a reboot of what is considered an iconic art style of an animated show seems to be underwhelming. What makes it even more underwhelming is that whatever you would say about the animation and art quality going into season 6 through 9a of original Spongebob, these latest seasons of OG Spongebob have created a new, fresh, wacky style. That while it's different from what you would expect if you were looking for something along the lines of pre-movie Spongebob is a step in the right direction in my opinion, given that it matches the high-paced energy of the show and allows for creativity amongst the artists and animators that work on each episode. I don't want to say that this is the finished product or even assume the budget that they had for this, but I do have to say that I hope it translates better on TV or in this case on phones and tablets and whatever people use to watch CBS All Access, now called Paramount+. Plus. More on that later. If it translates better than this 1x1 square ratio showing that we have, that would be honestly fantastic. I personally never had a problem with any of the character designs, they look pretty well and I believe that within a 3D medium they'll be squashed and stretched and they'll feel the way that you would think a 3D Spongebob show would feel. I did think some parts were too bright and jellyfish fields looked a little too bland, but the actual camp parts looked pretty solid to me, nothing amazing but it gets the job done and I have no complaints about it. Now I'm sure you're probably wondering what I thought about the baby fight aspect of everything. Considering that I had zero problems with baby nut, I had zero problems with baby bears, I'd had zero problems with total drama rama, or even my own character being babyfied, the premise of babyfication is one that I'm personally okay with, even though a lot of people are against it. I don't think baby looney tunes was the best incarnation of looney tunes, but it definitely didn't seem to be the worst, and it didn't have that much to do with the fact that they were babies. So likewise here, it's not that a baby Spongebob show that is based on a different timeline can't work, but it's about the implementation of it. If we see a great reboot, it doesn't matter. I'm sure there are logical or lore elements of the Looney Tunes show that goes directly against Looney Tunes before that and is inconsistent, but I don't care because the show is good. And I really do hope that this show turns out to be good. The animation seemed bouncy, but not enough personally. I much rather would have preferred if we went even more cartoony as you would have with recent episodes of OG Spongebob. However, given that I am of the rare kind that likes Fanboy and Chum Chum, another 3D Nickelodeon show that is super cartoony, wacky, and over the top, this might just be a me thing. 
The expressions seem to kind of just be there with a lot of them doing their job and being over the top, but I feel like certain ones were overused, like Spongebob's eyes going either really big or small when you want to show extreme emotion. Just because I want more cartoony portrayals doesn't mean I want more of the same. Variation is key, and when you're going over the top, exaggerated, hyperbolic, and cartoony, the sky is the limit. Lastly, the other fish didn't seem out of place with this new style, nor did the jellyfish. It had a cute feel, but I've seen cuter things things just on Neopets alone. I'll dive more into this when I talk about the humor, but the dynamic seems to be largely the same. If you didn't watch the third movie, I may spoil some things, so fast forward 20 seconds. SpongeBob seems to have an awkward but well-meaning relationship with Mrs. Puff as they've had within the entire OG show. SpongeBob seems to have an annoying kid that you begrudgingly don't hate but definitely would like better if he toned it down relationship with Squidward, as he's had at least within the later seasons of the show, and SpongeBob is even great friends with Patrick, as you'd expect. However, unlike within the third movie towards the end, it seems like they start off the first episode with Spongebob and Sandy knowing each other. The reason I say it's the first episode is because Deadline reports it as, quote, the series premiere, The Jellyfish Kid. That's quite a spoopy niche you got there, Spongebob. Yeah, it blows bubbles. <gasps> <laughs> Now, I understand that Spongebob didn't do this with Sandy in the first episode within the OG series, but that's because he would meet Sandy in the third episode. I know a source of contention with a lot of people was the fact that Sandy would know Spongebob when they were really young, which completely goes against the notion that Spongebob would have met Sandy within the episode T at the Tree Dome, which would be the third episode of the entire series where Spongebob is significantly older. And mind you, that third episode of the OG series goes back decades, so a lot of people have seen it. However, what I'd hoped was that when Spongebob meets Sandy within the first episode, they would explain this. And that at least shows that within this timeline, the Camp Coral timeline, that they covered their bases as to why there's a squirrel within a suit down here with exclusively aquatic life. By not doing that, you are leaning on the previous show's history and legacy. And when you do that, it creates friction when you lean on the legacy and the brand of what Spongebob Bob, the OG SpongeBob created, but then not listen to the history. What little, but still fundamental history of SpongeBob. SpongeBob and Sandy did not know each other since kids there. That's why T at the Tree Dome exists. It may just be me, but it's confusing to include an origin story within the end of the third movie, but then have the first episode assume a lot. Now, to have the benefit of the doubt, we may not have seen everything from this first episode, and maybe they spend the other five minutes of this 11 minute episode showing that. There's also a chance that they may have dived into this on another episode and the production order is out of whack. There's also the chance that this might not even be the series premiere, the true series premiere, and that I'm just reading too deeply into what Deadline said. I do hope they go into the origin of these two because that's important, at least to a lot of Spongebob fans, including myself. I do want to note that roughly the same people function as people of authority, Mrs. Puff, Squidward, Mr. Krabs, or as they call them within the show, Camp Master. Master Crabs. I don't know if that's what a C or a K for Camp Master, but yes, more or less, they function as authority figures in the show, some more than others. Given that they're shaking up the history, I actually wouldn't have mind if they shook up some of the dynamics. Plankton could be pretty chill with Sandy in this reboot, or maybe Patrick can annoy Mrs. Puff more than Spongebob in this reboot. I mean, if you're dead set on making this, you could at least give us something new there, but beyond that, the dynamics seem to be more of the same beyond the Sandy thing. I understand that these characters are Spongebob, they are to be portraying what Spongebob characters are to portray, but I don't get those tiny things that I would look for in a Spongebob episode. It's like when you open up Twitter and there's a new feature or a new UI change and it doesn't feel like the Twitter that you've been on, but we all begrudgingly adapt and then complain and get angry at the next change. I do want to believe that this is because of the fact that this is a reboot so you're not going to get the same feel, but then when I look at other reboots, 
like Rise of the TMNT or even the 2012 reboot of TMNT for that matter, at least twice have I watched a show and felt like they retained what I loved about the franchise and characters, even if those shows are fundamentally different in the ways that they would portray that. Sims 3 is one of, if not my favorite game of all time, and it largely doesn't have the same feel as Sims 1, but it has a lot of the same sentiment. It has a little bit of a nautical, tropical feel with the build of the tower or even retaining the iconic Spongebob clouds, the flower clouds. However, I don't feel like that's enough. I also think that it has something to do with the music. Even though it had the vibes that regular Spongebob background music has, a lot of it didn't really give me the aesthetic that you would want from Spongebob as a character, as a show. That tropical feel, you know the type of instruments that you would expect from this. I want to believe that when more episodes come out and I watch it and I get a better feel that I will understand what the core of this show is, but as of right now, it feels empty. I don't want to say soulless just yet because I actually want to see the episodes. I want to see the episodes in full and I want to get a better feel for what they're trying to do with the show. But it doesn't feel like I get a lot of substance here in these six minutes. And by substance, I don't mean a 20 episode arc where Sandy dies and Patrick and Spongebob get outed as imposters, but just humor. That can be substance, like great jokes, great humor. And speaking of, it worries me that a majority of the humor I got here was weak slapstick, and two times in which character A inconveniences character B for a long, noticeable, annoying period of time, and the punchline is that character B wants character A to finish what they were originally doing, even though character B was interrupted by character A. They did this twice. Spongebob and later Patrick would interrupt Squidward, who was simply trying to make sure that everyone was ready and prepared to go jellyfishing for the first time. And they would do this for a long, long period of time, past when it was actually funny, just for Patrick to yell at Squidward to get on with it and stop stalling, despite everything being stopped by Patrick and his stupidity. I think I left the stove on! Patrick, we have no stove! Oh, well, what's a hold up? Blow your whistle! Later on, they would do this exact same joke and set up again. Spongebob's mother would inconvenience Spongebob's jellyfishing, literally giving us the adults from Peanuts' Wawa voice just for the punchline after an annoyingly lengthy, overdone period to ask if Spongebob caught a jellyfish. That's what he was trying to do the entire time. I get that that's a joke, but that's not funny. At least to me. If these are the two jokes that Nickelodeon was proud to premiere as a sneak peek for Camp Coral, that worries me because this is the type of humor in some of the worst episodes of Spongebob that I didn't like. I don't feel like this show is going to be funny, at least to me. Maybe it'll be funny to a younger audience. Maybe that's what they're looking for. Maybe it doesn't even matter because it's Spongebob and they'll enjoy it anyway. Maybe people find what I at least think to be an annoyingly ignorant version of Spongebob and Patrick to be funny. Nothing in here I perceived to be clever or subtle, and it just seemed like they were going the route of being brash and in your face, and there isn't that example of like great dialogue focused humor or something subtle that you would like if you were an earlier fan. Beyond that, we did get some other things like Mrs. Puff and the kids around Mrs. Puff being splattered by paints, or Spongebob plopping over like a fool within Camp Master Krabs' cabin, but overall, I found the humor to be the weakest aspect of Camp Coral so far, which again, is worrying. So, with this going to Paramount Plus, the rebranded version of CBS All Access, I do fear the quality of the other reboots now. Given that they're all supposedly coming out within a few years, they don't seem to be going the route of letting one reboot breathe and then feeling out the general reception for that first reboot, you know, after 20 years of not giving us reboots, and waiting for the initial shock of this first reboot to just mellow out, and then testing out other ideas based off of the reception of the first one. It seems like they're just going to push all of these out within a few years, and while I can at least withhold my criticisms towards what the shows would be like until now, at least for Cam Coral, getting this sneak peek gives me a clearer picture as to what I should expect. I'm not as excited as I was looking at the still images and enjoying the art style that I saw in them. Or even as excited as I was, albeit a lot less, when I saw the third movie. 
And I really hope this doesn't begin the period where every single reboot sucks from a franchise, but there's some gems, like with Scooby-Doo and Mystery Incorporated, or Tom and Jerry with The Tom and Jerry Show. I really want to believe that the timing with Nickelodeon had less to do with someone's passing, and more to do with expanding in the way that a lot of other stuff within the last 5 to 10 years have expanded, and wanting to experiment there and maybe make something cool and expand the universe a little bit, but seeing this, I'm a little bit worried. I want to be proven wrong, I really do. I, I want to come back and quote the parts in here where I said that this isn't really that funny or this doesn't look too good and show like great examples of humor or something really beautiful or, or well done or something that looks like it had a lot of effort and craft and thought put into it. But given that this won't come out for a while, we'll just have to see. I have a few other pre-Camp Coral ideas that I may try out, but this video is long enough for a first impression. In the meantime, let me know what you guys think think in the comments down below, a special thanks to Nero of Toongrin for giving me the heads up that this existed, cause I didn't know at the time, and thank you so much for your time. Take care. Now out.